I think as sentient human beings, we have a moral obligation to treat our environment and animals that are in it with moral wisdom. The cruelest thing a human can do to a fur-bearing animal or any game wildlife is to fail to harvest their numbers and allow them to overpopulate. We have an opportunity to harvest these animals using sustainable management practices and humane traps. It's an amazing thing, what modern wildlife management, it's billions and billions have been invested in, in uh, how to manage these populations uh, effectively. The key tool we have today, and I say we, is folks who are trying to manage and protect and preserve our natural resources, such as fur bears, is the users themselves, trappers. They're our scientific tool on the landscape today. I don't think anybody champions wildlife conservation with more interest and with more fervor than, than trappers do. So, what are you guys doing this weekend? I'm gonna go to the movies with Ethan. I got a hot date with my Xbox. How about you? I'm going trapping. What? what? Trapping? What? Yeah. I go trapping with my grandfather. You know, an activity <laughs> in the woods. Jeez. It's actually really fun. Do you want to come? Oh, uh, uh, maybe. What am I getting myself into? No, it'll be fun. At least you'll get outside, experience nature. And you're into environmental issues. Sustainability, stuff like that, right? Yeah. Well, trapping is a sustainable activity that helps the environment. All right, all right. I'm sold. See you tomorrow. Okay. A significant part of wildlife management is maintaining healthy populations of wildlife on a landscape. And you may think that that would in imply not harvesting animals, but in fact, it's necessary to harvest animals. Trying to maintain a healthy population means actually keeping it in check, keeping it in balance with the landscape's ability to sustain them. It's really quite difficult to be an animal in the wild. And there's lots of ways that animals die. I mean, they die from getting hit by cars. They die from predation. They die from disease. And then trappers who really, really care about animals actually take animals that would otherwise die of other means. And wildlife biologists and trappers alike care about the perpetuation of these wildlife populations because that's really what's important from the standpoint of ecosystem health. Hey, Emily. Oh, really great to see you. You must be Jack. Hey, Mr. Lewis, nice to meet you. Welcome to Hands-On Wildlife Management. Emily must have told you all about what this is, sustainable management of wildlife. Sustainability is pretty simple. We're gonna keep wildlife around for perpetuity. We worked real hard to get good habitat, good laws, all to keep wildlife healthy, happy, and in balance with its habitat. Nice hat. Fur. Ah, can I see that for a minute? Beautiful red fox. You know, mankind's been dealing with red foxes for millennia. And if we and the biologists and the game wardens all work together, we'll have red fox around for millennia. When you think back on the fur trade history and uh, where it's been, and, uh, and it is really an incredible story. I mean, much of the cities, many of the cities that we know today, Chicago, St. Louis, New York, were all founded as fur trading outposts. And, you know, I'm not going to suggest that the fur history, the history of the fur trade is, is perfectly pretty. I mean, it was unregulated for, for really many, many years. And uh, many of our populations were not necessarily completely wiped out, but were really driven to the furthest extent of their ranges. In the early years of the American fur trade, uh, it was an entirely economic investment made by people trying to get a struggling country onto its feet. And as a result, there wasn't a great deal of attention paid to managing the wildlife for the future. And then you combine that with the uh, habitat changes where we converted much of our forest land to ag land. 
Many of our fur bear populations didn't stand a chance. The biggest threat to wildlife today is the loss of habitat. It's not regulated trapping. Every time we convert habitat to something other than wetlands or forest, we are probably impacting the population into the future. And maintaining that habitat takes effort on the parts of wildlife biologists, public citizens, trappers, hunters. One of the key factors that really enabled the protection and management of all wildlife in North America, particularly in the United States, was the creation of something we call PR, Pittman Robinson. Whenever you buy any archery equipment, firearms, or ammunition, you may not know it if you're a sportsman, but you're paying an excise tax. And those, that money is being sent to the federal government and given back to the states to manage wildlife populations. In the year 2012, the Pittman-Robinson Act from Sportsman raised $256 million for wildlife conservation. Habitat's the key. When we talk of the abundance and distribution of all wildlife in North America today, whether it's fur bears like fisher or bobcat or otter, or songbirds like chickadees or cardinals, we need habitat. They need a place where they have food, cover, water, and area to roam. Well, look around, kids. This is perfect wildlife habitat here. You can see all the cover, food source. You wouldn't believe the mice and red squirrels that are in here. I'm in here in the wintertime on snow, and you just wouldn't believe the tracks. There's water, plenty of water down through there, and most important of all, there's space. I, mean, I like to think of, of trappers really as partners in wildlife management. They possess the skills and the knowledge that we need as wildlife managers, wildlife biologists, to understand these species and to be able to collect data from those species. So almost all of the information that wildlife biologists use to conserve and manage fur bear populations comes from trappers. We'll actually take some tissue samples and have her tested for mercury. And in many states, um, trappers have to turn in the carcasses of the animals they trap, and those are processed to age and sex those animals, which gives us information about whether the population is increasing or decreasing. Wildlife biologists daily consult and, and directly use the data that trappers and fur hunters produce. Uh, when I'm trapping, I'm in the field every day, and I'm in the same place in the field every day. Every change becomes significant to me because it wasn't there yesterday. So trapping is a very valuable wildlife management tool and it's used for many different wildlife management activities. One of the most important ones is that animals can be trapped with the kinds of traps that trappers use every day and relocated to areas where they have become extinct or endangered. And so here in Vermont, we've actually done that twice now. We've, we've had trappers trap Fisher in Maine and Martin in Maine and New York and then we've moved them and released them here in Vermont. We now have a fisher population that's so abundant that we have a trapping season on fisher, and the martin population is growing every day. Okay, let me make a set for you. I'm sorry, no offense, but can't traps actually really hurt animals? So if you get something other than a coyote, you'll injure them to the point where they may not be able to survive? <laughs> That's a little misconception a lot of people have. Let me show you something. Ready? That was true once, that image of a horrible rusty trap that hurts the animal, but now the traps just hold onto the animal's paw and doesn't let them go. Grandpa once caught a cat when we were trying to get some skunks away from the town hall, and we just let the cat go. He went right off. When most people think of traps today, they think of, you know, what traps were before, what they used to be. And, you know, they, they have visions of these large, you know, steel traps with interlocking teeth. And in fact, you know, traps have evolved greatly, particularly in the last two decades. Um, and trapping methods have evolved greatly. 
in the last 15 years, um, we've done an extensive research project. It's probably the largest the one ever. Right. Trap doesn't have to be huge, and it doesn't have to be strong to hold good. Yeah. And we but, but wanted to make sure that traps and trapping were doing the most for animal welfare, safety of the trapper, efficiency, and um, selectivity. You know, the, the modern foothold trap, for example, is perhaps the most widely deployed trap by trappers in, in the United States and is, to many people's surprise, a very, very humane trap. They weren't fighting the trap at all. Half the time you walk up and the fox is sound asleep, he didn't hear you coming. What a set actually is, is the trap, of course. But the most important thing is the location and to a very lesser extent, whatever the attractor happens to be. Now, the thing you have to understand with coyotes and most fur bearers is that they don't have sweat glands and they live in a world of smells. So what happens is they pass their body odors out through their urine and we can cr get that coyote to think that I've got another coyote in this area and he's gonna come in and wanna check this out because that other coyotes in here is after his food and perhaps his territory. And that's what I'm gonna to try to create with this set. They have an ability to smell that's 8,000 times better than ours. They have an eight power vision set of eyes and they can hear a mouse squeak in calm weather 200 yards away. So if I take this trap and put it down here, put a squirt of coyote urine back there, that coyote coming down this cart road is gonna smell that and he's gonna say, whoa, there's another coyote in my area and I want to know who he is and what he is because they can tell everything about that animal because their body odors pass out through the urine. And if you notice, I'm putting it right on this spot right here and it's going to focus all his attention on that spot and his feet are going to be right there. And we're going to come back tomorrow and check and you'll get a chance to see a live coyote in a trap. But this is the part that's so fascinating about it. The more you catch, the more you study, even if you miss an animal, you come in and you say, why did I miss him? What was he doing? What was the weather like? Why did they react the way they did? This stuff is so fascinating. In 30 years, I feel like I don't know anything about them because every year I continuously learn and learn and learn. <laughs> it's just amazing. For me, coyotes are, in many ways, and particularly in the areas of, of the West where I live, uh, the apex predator. So I, I find him to be the species to be the most adaptable, most admirable, most remarkable animal alive. And, and uh, to match wits with that animal to me is a, daily, is a daily adventure. And I find myself foolish in comparison on regular occasion. For trappers to be effective at catching these animals, they really have to immerse themselves in their habitats. They have to understand each of these, these species, individual behaviors, their habits. And, you know, we as wildlife managers turn to trappers for that knowledge. By knowing the habitats of the animals, I'm, I'm much more successful in placing my traps where I know they're going to be. I trap along the waterways, the ponds, the ditches, the creeks. And I have learned over the years to read the sign where the animal is going to go. The, they always travel the, the road that is least restrictive to them. When you go out and you see that you've missed that animal just by one step, it's just like, okay, I have to learn to think what that animal's thinking and to see if I can set the trap right where he will set his foot. We first started dating when she was 17 and I was actually still 17. But uh, I got started when I was about, <coughs> excuse me, about 11 years old. And my granddad uh, showed me how to make a muskrat set. You know, it's a challenge. These, you start out trapping and you don't have a lot of success and gradually you get smarter and you get a little better and you know but still there is no guarantee that you set that trap you're going to catch something there. It's a fair analogy to compare the pursuit of, a, of an intelligent animal like a coyote to a chess match where I make my adjustments he makes his adjustments he's predicting me I'm predicting him and sometimes I don't win. With trapping when you're actually getting after a live animal adds more adrenaline to it than what you'd have in a video game. The way video games and trapping is kind of similar is that in video games you have the object of getting through that mission. When you get a raccoon and you got he's on trail, you got to think of all the odds of he could go this way or he could go this way and maybe he could go straight through and get in your trap.
One of my responsibilities is to see that I pass along our heritage and educate the younger trappers that are coming up in the proper methods of take and how to treat the animals humanely. My grandpa started me off, I started hanging out with him. The best part of trapping for me is talking to all the old timers and learning all the knowledge and experience that they've been through through the years. My grandfather, we spend a lot of time together whenever we trap. A lot of bonding, you know, a lot of stuff he does. I don't know how many years it took me to pick out these little faint trails you can see. Yeah, I right? think trapping is very ethical. As trappers, we see what Mother Nature does. We see what happens with overpopulation. We see what happens with disease. And I think if we don't protect them and utilize them the way that it's supposed to be in order to control the population, then we, as parents, can't pass this on to our children. We deeply care about wildlife. We pay to see that it flourishes because it's in our best interest, it's in wildlife's best interest. When trappers take an individual animal, they take it knowing that they're actually benefiting the species and the population because they know that they're contributing to the long-term viability of that population. That's really great to have you here, Emily. Well, Jack, you learned an awful lot about trapping, trappers, and the value of trapping as wildlife management. You've listened to the professionals. You realize what value our knowledge has in wildlife management. Now let's take a selfie. <laughs>